Good morning. morning. Wasn't that good? I I, I love when I'm I'm, I'm an old school guy at heart. I love the old hymns, the what can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And then you tie that in with something new and just cool. And I love the way God gives people the talents and the abilities to do that. So I'm thankful that our worship team is, is able to do that and jump into that because that's the reality, folks. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ, that song is that you've never heard any truer words than that song, that it is the blood of Jesus Christ that will make you clean, period. Right. And there's nothing else you can try the world, you can try anything in the world, but it is him and only him that has the ability to restore a heart and to change a life. And I pray today that if you hear nothing else, if you don't hear anything in the principles that I'm giving concerning finances, that's okay with me, so long as you hear that Jesus Christ loves you enough to lay down his life for you. The Bible says, greater love hath no man than he would lay down his life for a friend. And Jesus proved that point in scripture and in history, and I'm so thankful that he did. So I'm glad that you guys are here today. As I said, we are in week three of I Was Broke, Now I'm Not. In the first two weeks, I really talked more about some principles as far as tithing and first fruits and what, the, what those mean and what those look like. Today, I, I'm, I'm going to mention it a time or two, but that's really not the emphasis of the message today, because what I've realized is that what we need sometimes is uh, we need tools. We, we don't need just information. Remember last week I used the uh, sunscreen illustration that said most of us have a sunscreen problem. It's not that we don't know where to go get it or actually what it's even used for. We just don't apply it. Well, it's the same way. Some of you today, I, I have been, I've been a pastor for nearly 15 years, about 14 and a half years. And in that time, I have had people come to me and say, Pastor Vince, man, I... Our marriage is struggling. We need some help. We don't know what to do. And I'm like, fantastic. You know, not fantastic that you're struggling, but fantastic. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what the Word of God says. Let's put the pieces back together. I've had people come in and go, Pastor Vince, um, my kids are demons. <laughs> and I just wish you could help me. And I go, nope. There's nothing I can do for your kids. Um, no, then we don't do that. We actually open the Bible and we go, okay, this is, this is what we do. This is what the Bible says about being a godly parent. And this is how you say no, because can I get an amen? Some kids just need to hear the word no, and it's okay. And I know kids are in the house are going, you suck, Vince. And that's okay. That's all right. Um, so, we, it is, so I've had that situation where parents have come in. I don't know how to be a good godly parent. I've had couples come in. We don't know how to be a good godly couple. I've had individuals come in and say, Vince, my, I'm struggling with this issue with anger, with lust, or with this or that in my life, and I don't know really how to deal with this one thing. And, and, it, and my, my spouse is good, my kids are good, but I'm wrestling with this. I don't know how to deal with this thing in my life. And I'm Hey, let's see what the Word of God says about it. Let's sit down, let's open up the book, and see what the Word of God says. In 14 and a half years of pastoring and ministering, I can count on less than this hand the amount of times someone says, Hey, Vince, I'm really struggling with my finances. You know, and I just don't think I know what to do. And I sure wish somebody would show me. Because let me just ask it this way. How many of you, since you have began getting a paycheck? I know for some of you that's a while back. But since you have got your first paycheck until this point in time, how many of you would honestly say, there's been some financial struggles here and there? Yeah. And yet it's the one thing we cease to ask. We don't just go... I'm struggling because it's a personal issue because if we've messed up our finances, then it's admitting that we've made a mistake, that I messed it up. And, and here's the reality, guys. As much, it, it, I'm pretty positive of this, that Jesus is in our midst, but I'm also fairly positive that none of you are him. So you, you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. There's going to be moments where you, you don't make the right decision you know, I've told you guys about Jennifer and I buying our first car. We had a paid-off truck. It was just the two of us, and we bought uh, a sports car because it was cool, and we thought we had to buy the sports car. It was an insane interest rate because we didn't have any credit whatsoever, and they said we could still buy it, and we said, okay, and we bought it, and we drove it home, and we got it home, and after about a month, we realized that Jennifer was pregnant with our first child, and Children in sports cars don't go really well. They don't mold the back seat for the 
car seat. And so we had to end up, we ended up trading that car off. And you guys know when you start trading cars, you get a bigger shovel to dig a bigger hole. Can I get an amen on that one? Anybody been there? And so we've wa- man, we have made some bonehead decisions financially. I've stepped in it a few times with money, you know. How many of you have actually forgot what you've done with money? Some of you are like, I would never do that. You lie like a dog. Yes, you did. You've done it before. We, we've done it. We've messed up. And so today what I want to do is I want to just give you three things. I want to give you just some, hopefully, some stress relievers, because how many of you know it's the holiday season and stress abounds? How many of you got family coming in this week? Dear Jesus, help us all, right? Yeah, because, I mean, some of you got, you got that family. And you know what I'm talking about, that family. You're sitting there at dinner waiting for the person to say something that's going to set the whole thing off. <laughs> Somebody's going to say, I see you made cranberry sauce again. <laughs> <laughs> I made the cranberry sauce last year. I guess it wasn't good enough because you had to make it this year. Yeah, just have families are awesome. <laughs> and we're about to walk into that season of stress, and they're going to come in, and, and then this family's going to come in and say something, and then when they walk out, the other family member's going to come in and say something about what that other family member said, and you're going to be right in the middle of it, and you don't want to deal with that. And so I'm hoping that today I can release some of the stress in your life on the financial end of things so that you're going to be equipped with enough patience to handle the stress on that end of things, all right? Because I can't fix your family. All right? I can't fix my family. So only God can do those things. But today we're going to be talking about, I'm just going to give you some tangible tools, some things that hopefully you will be able to grab onto. I pray that you take notes. I pray that you write this stuff down. If you don't have something to take notes, catch the podcast this afternoon. You can catch us on iTunes every Sunday. It's usually on there by about 1 o'clock. The podcast is. Video will be on there so you guys can catch up and take notes again. But I challenge you to do this because here's the thing that I know. There are people in the room right now that wish they had less financial stress than what they're dealing with. I know that's a fact. You don't have to amen it or raise your hand. I understand. Been there. Okay? So I know that those are things that are there. First thing I want you to do, if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Matthew. If you don't, you can read along. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. And here's the first point I want to give you. The first point is this. You have to realize that everything that you have, everything that you are, belongs to God. Say amen. The Bible tells us this, that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It doesn't say it, but it's insinuated. He also owns the hills in which that thousand cattle sit. All right? There's another scripture that says that God, he owns everything. He is the ruler of it all, the whole earth and everything that's in it. So that includes your stuff and my stuff. And so the Bible is really clear on us understanding and hoping that we understand that it's not ours. It's not mine, but I worked for it, Vince. That's a whole other sermon that we can spend hours and hours on. But the reality is, it's not yours. And let me just read the passage, and I pray that you hear the stress relief in this passage. Verse 19 is where we're going to start. It says, Don't store up treasures here on earth, where moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Catch this, verse 21. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. I'm just going to stop right there. We're going to come back and we're going to hit verse 24. But I want to break this down a little bit to you so that you understand. What Jesus is saying here, and these are, if you're old school Bible and you got your King James out there or whatever it is, these words are in red. This is Jesus talking, so it's good stuff. You need to pay attention. He says, here's the thing. If you place all your value and investment in things that are here on this earth, you're going to be disappointed. Because stuff on this earth breaks. Y'all ever had something break at the wrong time? Here, let me tell you, I'm a jeans guy. I like jeans. I like blue jeans. I like good jeans. Okay? I typically only have at any point in my life three pair of jeans. I I don't have a closet full of them. I have three. But I break them in and I wear them a long time because I like comfortable jeans. Any amens on the comfortable jeans thing? (laughs) Here's something that happened to me in the last two weeks. I'm down to one pair. 
I actually got an awe from one of some of you. You understand. I feel so good. Um, here's the thing. They, they didn't get stolen, and, and I didn't leave them any place. One of them was manufacturer malfunction. The zipper broke. Not my fault. <laughs> the other pair, I went to step into my Tahoe. Whoosh, right up this way. <laughs> it's not good. It's like it's full open back there. And they're gone. And I can't even use them again because it didn't rip on the seam where you could like get it fixed. It's right through the denim. It was a good one. They were getting a little snug anyway, but I didn't think they were that, that snug. But it, boom, I blew them out. They're gone. I'm never going to wear that pair of jeans again. I threw them in the trash and had a moment because I really valued those pants. But the reality was they weren't going to last me much longer anyway. The cars that I have, I love cars, but guess what? They're going to break down. They're going to fall apart. You're going to do your best to keep it clean, and then you're going to park in that Bermuda Triangle of door dings called the Walmart parking lot. <laughs> and you're going to pull into some, next to somebody, and they're not going to think about it, and their kid's going to open the door, and they're not going to be quite strong enough to open the door, so they're going to go, boom. And when they kick the door, it's going to hit your door, and your nice brand new car is going to have a little ding inside of it, and there's not much you can do about it. Oh, yeah, I'll get that person. No, because what that person's going to do is they're going to look like they're writing a note that says, here's my insurance information. Please call me if I mess up your car. And what they're actually writing is, I'm not leaving you any information. Sorry, I hit your car. And then they're running away. <laughs> it's going to break down. It's going to fall apart. It's going to rust. Actually, the Bible says it's going to rust. It's going to fall apart. You know, I can remember things. And, 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 you know, everything we talked in week one about change and how everything changed. God says, listen, wherever you place your treasure, whatever you invest in, wherever your money goes, that's where your desires really are. That's what you, that's what you want to see succeed. And guys, we're going to jump onto it here in a little bit when we talk about budget. But when you start looking at the places that your money goes, you'll see very quickly what your desires are or where your heart is. Because if it's not ours and we're just asked to manage it, that's what God's telling us here in this passage. He says, look, if your treasure is in stuff that's in the world, it's going to go away. Let's hurry up because I'm going to run out of time. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. You guys are familiar with this verse. You will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Good verse right there. Verse 25, that is why I tell you, love this verse, not to worry about everyday life. How many of you know I could preach a whole year on just that phrase? Do not worry about everyday life. But Vince, you don't know the stress that I got. I know, but I know the God that you should be serving, and he's bigger. All right? He goes on to say in this passage, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, that was a personal scripture for me right there on the clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in the barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you... Far more valuable than they? Can all of your worries add one single moment to your life? Ooh, that's good. Yeah, you're not going to get any older adding a, adding a worry. It's not going to last you any longer. Verse 28, and why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your what? Come on, say it with me. All of our what? Our needs. We're going to find out in a second. That's really where the rubber meets the road. Our needs. Verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, God. I pray that we understand that it's all yours. That everything we've been given, the abilities we've been given, the resources we've been given, Lord, we've just been made managers of it because you love us. 
because you care for us, because you want the best for us. And so, Lord, I pray today that people would hear my heart in this, that they would not hear condemnation, that they would not hear judgment, but they would hear the word of God spoken as it is. And, Lord, it would pierce their heart. Father, I pray that you would be with me as I preach this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. So first thing is making sure you understand and realize that it's not yours. God has made you a manager of it. In fact, that all started back in the beginning with Adam and Eve. When Adam was there, God came down and said, Adam, I'm going to give you dominion over all the living things. You tend it. You manage it. Adam didn't make any of it. But God gave Adam the ability and the authority to manage it. Just like the income and the resource in your life, God gave you the ability to manage it. And you say, well, Vince, I'm horrible with money. Okay, let me, give you, let me change the word. Some of you need to work on your ability managing it. But he gave you the opportunity to manage it. And here's something I know about God's income. 90% will always and forevermore go farther than 100% if you do it through Jesus Christ. Always. Uh, you can argue with me now till Jesus comes back, and when he gets here, he's going to go, no, he's right, and you just have to deal with it. Because that's what's going to happen. All right, so the first thing is understanding that it's not yours. Second thing is this. Rationalizing how you spend your money doesn't help. Any of you guys justifiers? Well, it was just a Coke. It was just this. It wasn't that big a deal. It was just an extra gift that I needed to buy. It was just this. And we make sure, we try to lessen its value by saying it was just. It was just a new car. It wasn't that big a deal, really. Yes, it was. It was a car. It was just a Coke. Well, yeah, but you have one every day. A Coke, Vince? Seriously? Yeah, here. I stopped on the way to church this morning and bought one of these. Dollar seventy-nine. $1.79. I know some of you are like, wow. Some of you are like, yeah. Because you buy two of these at a time. Because 20 ounces just isn't quite enough. And I understand, okay? I'll get to my own confessions here in a moment, all right? But $1.79, when you see $1.79, you don't think much about $1.79, but how many of you, don't raise your hand, please, how many of you would say that you probably drink one of these a day? You stop, you swing in, you're getting gas, you're thirsty, you grab something to drink because there is a plethora of choices. You can have everything from Red Bull to Monster to Mountain Dew to Diet Pepsi and Diet Coke. It doesn't matter. You can get it. You can have it, and they're all right there. So $1.79 a day, if you look at this, let's go ahead and look at this number. One drink from a convenience store is $1.79. If you have one of those a day, it's going to cost you $650 a year to drink one Coke a day. $650 is a pretty nice TV. It's a really nice TV. That's Actually, I passed a sign the other day. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you always want to go on vacation? Like a nice one, just go someplace. I, I seen it on the sign the other day. Two people, a couple, can go do a four-day cruise in the Caribbean for 500 bucks. Oh, yeah, but you buy a Coke every day. <laughs> Honey, I'm sorry, we can't afford a vacation. Yes, you can, you just don't afford the vacation. Amen. Second thing, let's jump onto this wagon while we're here. One pack of cigarettes, $6.36 a pack. Now here, hold on. Before anybody gets weird and starts saying, oh, he's going to beat up the smokers. I ain't going to beat up the smokers. Why do you think I got Hardy's bag right here? <laughs> I want you to understand and realize the thing is, it's not about the money. It's about your heart and where it's going. But these are simple things that we sometimes overlook. We don't stop and look at just the numbers. One pack of cigarettes is $6.36. If you're a three packs a week person, you spend a thousand bucks a year on cigarettes. I thought, well, man, that's not, you know, for people that smoke, that's not really that bad. For people that smoke, that's a thousand bucks a year. That's two vacations. You could have went in the spring and the fall <laughs> to the Caribbean. Now your wife is looking like you, like you're quitting today. <laughs> it's over. I'm cutting it off. But the reality is a lot of people are more than three packs a week. They're a pack a day. You start looking at that and start putting those numbers together and you start going, oh, wow, man. That's, that's over $2,000 a year that I smoke, that disappears, that there's no value. In fact, the only thing that that will bring you is this is an actual statistic. They actually have done a health care breakdown on what each pack of cigarettes will cost you in health care. Look at this. Health care costs per pack, $35. For every pack of cigarettes you smoke, it's going to cost you $35 in medical expenses later on down the road. 
So what you spend $1,000 on this year is going to cost you $6,000 down the road. That's a great investment. And we go, but that doesn't happen with everybody. You're right, it doesn't. Let's move on. Let's go on. Hardee's. I don't eat at Hardee's because Hardee's is one of the most expensive fast food chains that there is. Now, if you work at Hardee's, God bless you. I'm thankful that you're working. I pray that God bless you. It's just a personal thing, all right? I like Hardee's. Their chicken strips are awesome, but I don't eat there a lot. I love the phrasing. This is what the restaurants will do for you. They will say, it's an extra value meal. How many of you know that's not true? Say amen. amen. What it is, it's an extra convenient meal. You can say, give me a number one, give me a number two, give me a number three. The average meal at McDonald's right now, when they first came, how many of you remember when a Big Mac meal cost you three fifty? It's not anymore. Some of you know right now off the top of your head, all right? And that's okay. Because here's the deal. If you're at one, the average cost of an extra value meal is $6.80. If you have a meal four times a week, some of you are like, no, I do not eat that trash four times a week. Okay, let's say you and your wife eat there twice a week. Two fast food meals over a seven-day period, some, that's not unrealistic. $1,400 a year. Some of you eat there more. And we get told and we get convinced that this is a value to us, that this is something that's going to save us money. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're smart, you can eat at Chili's every week for less than this. No, you can't. Yes, you can. I'll show you my receipt. Jennifer and I eat at Chili's every week. Every week. We walk out of there and we never pay more than $10.80 for both of us to eat till we're full. Yeah, now you're listening, huh? what you have to do is you, you have to think. You have to not rationalize. Well, it's just a meal. It's just this. It's just that. It's just because it's just money. And God forbid I stand and look at any of my kids when they're about ready to go off to college and I look at them and go, I really like cheeseburgers. And because I spent $1,400 a year while you were growing up, and if I do the math on that times 10, that's just till you're 10 years old. That's $14,000 that I've spent on cheeseburgers. And if I wait till you're 20 to, for you to go to school, then that's $28,000 for you that I could have sent you to college with. My bad. Now, maybe you guys don't think like I think. And that's okay. You don't have to think like I think. But what I do want you to do is begin thinking like a manager of what God has given you. If your life was a business and God was checking your books and going, hey, I want you to run the business of your life, how does it look? Would your business fail or would it succeed? You know the answer already. But you've got to be mindful of this stuff because if not, you're just going to keep rationalizing it. And how you fix that is for a month. Here's what I want you to do. For a month, if you don't want to do this, no harm, no foul. It's not my money, it's yours, and, or it's God's money. It's, you're going to do with it what you want to anyway. But for a month, sit down and you track everything you spend. Everything that you spend. If you buy a newspaper, write it down. If you buy a $1.79 Coke, write it down. If you do like Jennifer and I do, and you go buy two styrofoam cups, $2.17 every day at Walmart or McDonald's, we, hey, I broke it down. Over $700 a year do I spend at McDonald's on styrofoam cups with Coke in it. Yep. So I'm not here preaching at you. This is something that I've had to look at and go, man, what could I have done for the kingdom? What, what else could I have done for my kids? What else could I... Man, I, that's that vacation that I told Jennifer that we couldn't do. And it's a shame because we can. And I keep saying we can't. And so many of us do that with God. God comes in and he says, hey, this is what I want you... This is where I want you being faithful at. This is how I want you to walk forward. And we say, God, I can't. But the reality is, God, we won't. Because we rationalize everything that goes out. Well, it's just this, or it's not that big a deal. It's, I'm really thirsty, so I needed this. Wait till you get home and get a drink of water. Oh, no, no, no. Vince, come on, water, seriously? Yeah, seriously, it's worked forever. <laughs> this is how cheap I am. You know when you guys talk about, when I told you me and Jennifer go to Chili's? We go to Chili's and we drink a water. Yeah, And then we leave and go through McDonald's and get a Coke, because the Cokes at McDonald's are a buck, and at Chili's they're $2.00. <laughs> 
I'm chief. That's okay. I don't mind it because the reality is it allows me to do other things that I want to do. I want to make sure that the things that I, my kids need are there. I want to make sure that when the time comes and we want to go spend a weekend, we can do that. But that doesn't just happen. You've got to be thinking and you've got to not rationalize all the money that goes out. You've got to know where it goes because here's the third thing. You have to direct where your money goes. You've got to redirect where it goes because right now, it's going somewhere, but chances are you don't know where it's going. And you can't tell something where to go if you don't know where it's at. <laughs> it's pretty logical, I know. Some of you are going, and that's the reality. Go ahead. Step outside, scream at your neighbor's house, and tell them to go mow the yard. It's not going to happen because they may not be in the house. And when you're sitting there and you're looking at your money and you're going, man, I wish we could do this. You can do that, but you've got to take control of the situation and manage it. God has given you the opportunity to be a steward of everything that he's given you. So make sure that you are a steward. Let's look at this passage. I want you to see this. And as, as we go on here, Proverbs 22, 7 says this, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. The King James Version says the borrower is slave to the lender. Because here's the deal. If you are under a mountain of debt, you don't get to redirect your money. It's already got a place to go. And the more that you stay there, the less you're going to have to be able to direct. And God doesn't want you in a place where you're not managing. So Vince, we're the only debt I got to my house. Well, good on you. Praise God. I don't have any credit card debt. Thank, thank God for that. And I'm, I'm pleased for you, but Here's the thing, to start this, and I told you I wanted to give you some tools. Here's the thing. Uh, there's a website. It's I was broke, now I'm not, or IWBNIN.com. And you can go there, and there are free resources. There are budget sheets. There are cash sheets. So basically, you can look at it, and you can go, this is what I spent, so that you know where you are. It's the same principle. You remember when Philip preached to us in No More Dancing Chickens, and that first week he said, you've got to find the X. You've got to find out where you are. That's the principle. Guys, God's principles haven't changed. If you don't know where you're starting, you're not ever going to get anyplace else. And so you get that, sat down and you look at your wife and she looks at you and you get real serious about a budget. But we got to make sure that we get real serious about a budget because here, let me just give you some, some basic ideas on what a budget is because here's the problem. Is if we want to redirect our money, then you're going to have to budget. And here's some of the non-negotiables that go in a budget. Right here. Rent or mortgage. You got to have a place to live. Say Amen. So you got to pay that. Second thing is utilities. Let me clarify utilities. Because some people get weird about this. What it takes to survive in utilities is water, electric, and if your stove or heat takes gas, then gas. If it takes wood, go cut down a tree. <laughs> Those are utilities. Oh, wait, wait. Wait a minute, what about my cell phone? Nope, you can get a landline for a fraction of the cost. <laughs> well, but that's, I can't go on Facebook with my landline. You're right. It doesn't, just, Facebook is not a non-negotiable, okay? And so make sure that when you're sitting there, you're breaking this stuff down. Groceries. Groceries are a big one. You gotta eat, amen? Everybody like to eat, say amen. Hey, you're about to go spend some bank on some groceries over the next couple weeks. It's just going to happen. You're going to hit Walmart, and they're going to set all those pumpkin pie recipes out there, and you're going to go, I think I'm going to make that. And you're never going to make it, but you're going to buy the stuff to make it. <laughs> Some of you ladies just amen to me in your heart. You know you did. But there are ways you can fix this, too. You can be smart in this. You can think about it. My wife, Jennifer, she, she works here at the church as a volunteer, and her job, other than being the mother to my five kids, she saves us money grocery shopping. Miss Breland is here. She works at Walmart. She can tell you when my wife comes to the checkout counter, it's kind of like, oh, dear Jesus. Because she comes with her notebook, with her coupons, with her stuff, and she sits it down there. And Jennifer has shown me receipts where she walks out and saves us $200 a week on groceries. See, some of y'all want to follow me around for a week, don't you? I'm going to eat at Chili's, and I'm going to watch your wife grocery shop. Don't be a creeper. Just ask her. All right? Because if you'll think, if you're smart, if you'll just take some time. But that's the problem. We live in a world that's constantly doing this. We're rushing, we're rushing, and we don't have the time. You do have the time if it's valuable to you. Remember, where your treasure is, that's what's valuable to you. God says, don't let it be in stuff here. Because the stuff here is going to go away. Let it be in me. And if your value is in me, 
I'll take care of the rest of the stuff. I'll handle the clothes. I'll handle the food. I'll handle all that stuff. But you've got to trust me. You've got to trust me. And so when you lay out the budget, make sure you understand that there are certain things that are essentials. Please, for the love of God, have clothes. <laughs> That's something you've got to have. But then people start adding to it. And you guys have heard this thing about Scripture, you know, where you can't add to it or take away from it. It's what the Word of God is. You just, you just got to take it like it is. Budgets are much way the same way. People start adding to it. They go, well, i got to have cable. I got my satellite events. I got to have that. Well, why? Because it's football season and the Sunday ticket, and I got to have that. And that's an extra. I know it's extra, but I got to have it. Okay. There are some illustrations that run through my mind that I'll not share because they might be offensive or sound judgmental. But again, I don't want to stand before God or my kids and go, it was really that important. There are activities my kids don't do. They get told no. Because it's not one of the non-negotiables. Now, do they get to do a bunch? Sure. Sure. If they're not in trouble or grounded or whatever, like anybody else's kids, they get to do whatever. They have a good time. See, there comes a point when you have to just stop and go, God, if I stop and look at my life, everything that is valuable to me is it's $1.79 Cokes because that's where my money goes. It's an extra value meal because that's where my money goes. It's my $200 cable bill because that's where my money goes. And God's going, well, well, just real quick, where do I fit in this picture? Although I'm the one that gave you everything, I'm the one that's provided all of it, is there any return? And there are certain biblical principles that I, I want this, this verse here. Let me, tell you, let me tell you where Jesus fits in this as we come to the close. John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says this. He says, yes, I am the gate. And those who come in through me will be saved. And they will come and go freely and will find food, good pasture. Good pastures. I love that because what it means is they'll be satisfied. They'll be fulfilled. They'll be good. They're not, they may not have everything, but they're going to be, it's going to be good pastures. They're not going to need anything. They're not going to have any want. It's going to be good. And that's what God wants for you in your life. He wants you to come to a place where there are good pastures. Does it mean you're going to drive a new car? No. Does it mean you're going to have the best of everything? Why would it? That's what I want. No, 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 no. You're misunderstanding. God says, I'm going to give you everything that you need. And when you learn to be satisfied with what you need, you'll be amazed at what happens to the wants. You'll be amazed at what happens to them. But see, the verse doesn't end there. It goes on and says, the thief's purpose. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Now tell me some of you aren't living in that place where your joy has been destroyed. You're not having any joy because you're so stressed about what's going to happen tomorrow or where this is going to come from or where that's going to come from. You don't have any peace because your relationships are being torn apart because of this one thing. And I know it's easy to compartmentalize. Well, this is my church stuff. This is my work stuff. This is my family stuff. And over here is my financial stuff. And God, you can be involved in all this, but leave this stuff alone. And this is exactly where the thief has attacked. He said, I'll wipe you out. I will steal it, I will kill you, and destroy everything in your world given the opportunity. That's who he is. Jesus comes right back in and says, although that's his purpose, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. See, God doesn't want you struggling and stressed. That's not his purpose. He says it here in the New Testament. He says it in Jeremiah in the Old Testament that my, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They are good. They're not evil. They're to give you hope and an end that is expecting something to look forward to. That's my purpose for your life. And Jesus is trying. He's trying. And so often we miss that. 
and we step away from it and we pull back from it, when God is going, I'll give you all the tools. It's in the book. I'll give you all the answers. They're in the book. I'll tell you everything you need to do. It's in the book. And that scripture tells us that he does this. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would open the door unto me, I will come in. It's a real interesting thing about that scripture. Not once ever does Jesus kick the door in. His words are very clear. If anyone would open the door, I will come in. You may not have been able to do this on your own, and that's okay. I learned a lesson in my first pastorate. In my first pastorate, Jennifer and I were young. We just had the girls, Vanessa and Kaylee, were real little. And I was sitting on the pew one of the Sundays, and I didn't tithe. I know I was a preacher, and I didn't tithe. But it was just assumed I knew what that meant. And I didn't. I, I, just, I was the preacher's kid. My mom and dad always tithed. I never thought about it until God really convicted me about it, and I started. And, and I would sit there, and we'd do the, the weekly thing. And one Sunday, I'm sitting in church. I'm on the front row getting ready to preach. They're taking up the offering. And God spoke to my heart, just a real subtle way, hey, I want you to give $60. I said, um, I'd love to give $6, God. I think that would be a great idea. And he corrected me. <laughs> he said, no, 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 60, 60, 60. And I said, God, I'm not doing that. I said it that clearly. I can remember the prayer as I sat there listening, and I said, I'm not doing that. We're leaving today. God to go to Ohio as soon as church ends, and that's my gas money to get there. I want my kids to see their grandparents, and, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm sorry, God, I'm, I am not going to do it. See, I rationalized it, justified it. I, want my, I even brought my kids into it. I want them to see their grandparents. So service closed. I preached that day on God's faithfulness and how good he is, and I preached, and the service closed, and I walked out, and there was a man standing in the foyer in the back, and he said, uh, are you the pastor? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, I got a question for you. I said, what's that? He said, my dad died, and we don't have anybody. I live in California, and my flight leaves tomorrow. I was wondering if you would be able to just meet me at the cemetery at 8 in the morning. He said, I just think somebody should say something. You know, I, I don't want to be there alone. I thought, yeah, I, okay. So I went, and I told Jennifer, I said, Jay, I said, we're not going to leave till tomorrow. It'll be okay. We'll still make it in time, not a problem. And I got there that morning, and it was me, the son, the casket, and the backhoe driver. He never even got out of the backhoe. He just sat there with it running during the service, which wasn't much of a service. It was me and him, and I, I opened my Bible, and I, I said, God, we, we trust you with this man's spirit to be faithful to do what you always do. Lord, I don't know his life, but you do. And so I trust you with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Close. Took us about five minutes. Walking back to the car, the son come over and he grabbed me. He shook my hand. He put a little money in my hand. I said, sir, you don't have to do that. It's fine. It's no problem. It's no problem. He said, no, I have to do that, but I got to go. I got to catch my flight. So he jumped in the car, took off. Never, I've never seen him again. I called Jay. I said, hey, honey. I said, get the kids ready. We're, I'm ready. I'm heading to the house. It was a lot quicker than I thought it'd be. Be ready to go. So I get up to the stop sign at the Gyne Y in Melbourne, Arkansas. Some of you know where that's at. Some of you don't. It doesn't really matter. I got to the stop sign right there. I reached in my coat pocket, and I pulled out the $60 that the son F gave me. And I pulled over on the side of the road, and I began to weep. And I said, God, I'm so sorry. How silly of me to assume that you didn't already have it figured out before you ever ask me of how you would provide, how you would restore, how you would build up, how you would take care of any lack, just like the birds of the field, just like the flowers of the field. You love me, and you won't let me fail, and you won't let me be underneath. God, you want this for me. And so I close with this. Church, seek ye first. Seek first the kingdom of God above all else. And he will provide everything else in your life. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's worries will take care of itself. For today, 
There's enough trouble in today. You be faithful in what God's blessed you with in every area of your life. I want you to bow with me, if you would, for just a second.